Hello everyone, my name is Laura Borges and my presentation is titled On the Geopolitical Origins of Strategic Cultures and Alliances, the Chinese-Russian Case. A quick biographical note, I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science and International Relations from the University of Berentier in Portugal and a Master of Arts in Strategy from the University of Lisbon. In the abstract, it is possible to verify the shortcomings that this research aims to address. The literature has yet to study how the geopolitical drivers of strategic culture influence the formation and consolidation of alliances, especially when it comes to the Chinese-Russian case. Therefore, the two main research questions that guide this presentation are what can the geopolitical imperatives underlying strategic cultures say about the potential for consolidation of a Chinese-Russian axis to counter U.S. power in Eurasia? Can the combination of geopolitical realities and strategic culture operate as a minor predictor of alliances? Essentially, this research aims to explain how the combination between geopolitics and strategic culture shapes alliances focused on the Chinese-Russian case. In terms of methodology, this is a qualitative research that relies on theoretical and conceptual propositions to explain the causal mechanisms underpinning the key research object, that is, Chinese-Russian military cooperation. And this is a document-based research. Its main sources are peer-reviewed articles from top scientific journals, books written by highly credentialed scholars, think tanks reports, articles published by private research institutions, namely Stratfor and Geopolitical Futures, and credible online sources. Now, defining the key concepts of this research. The first is geopolitics, and geopolitics can be defined as the scholarly study of the political and strategic importance of geographic factors in international politics. This definition is modeled on the approach proposed by classical theorists, including Mahan, Mackinder, the, Ger the German school, and Spikeman. Another key concept, strategic culture, this research opted for the definitions and approach proposed by the first generation of scholars of strategic culture, mainly Jack Snyder and Colin Gray, because this approach offers a more comprehensive view to strategic culture. It doesn't detach strategic culture from actual behavior, and it allows the legacy imprinted by geography, historical experiences, and political inputs to play a role in the construction and expression of a country's strategic culture. Unlike Johnston's proposition, for example, which tends to dissociate strategic culture from strategic behavior, Johnston's approach might be more methodologically sound, but it offers a very narrow and incomplete view of strategic culture. For Alliance, this research used Walt's definition, and it's important to keep in mind the word informal in this definition. Now, how does geography and strategic culture converge? Well, varied groups of people settled into territories with different geographic characteristics, so they had to develop different strategies to utilize their respective territory in a way that ensured their survival and prosperity. This led to the development of distinct habits and attitudes towards life, towards their own sense of self, and towards their neighbors. For example, Maritime insular powers might develop different strategies compared to continental nations that, that have to be constantly worried about defending their borders from land invasions. Therefore, geography imposes distinctive constraints and provides distinctive opportunities that have profound implications for policy and strategy. Now, regarding the geographic inclinations of, strategic, of Chinese strategic culture, historically China developed a strategic culture shaped by its status as a land power, constantly threatened by invasions from nomadic tribes to its northwest, the so-called strategic periphery. According to Chinese military sources from 1100 BCE, which takes us back to the Western Zhou dynasty to 
1911, the end of the Qing Dynasty, China engaged in a total of 3,790 internal and external wars. A great chunk of these wars were military campaigns to neutralize nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes and kingdoms along China's strategic periphery. This continental inclination persisted during Mao's regime, but two major events caused a turning point to China's strategic culture. The first was Deng Xiaoping's reform, reforms, and the second, perhaps most important, was the fall of the Soviet Union, which eliminated the main land-based threat to China since the Sino-Soviet split in the 1960s. From there on, China began exploring its maritime potential more often, and consequently China's economic geography has undergone significant changes in the past decades. Nowadays, China's dominant industrial hubs are located along the Yangtze River and Pearl River Delta regions. Innovative activity is largely concentrated in the coastal region's largest metropolitan areas. Guangdong and Zhejiang, for example, are leading zones of granite patents. Shenzhen has established itself as a major comprehensive innovation hub in hardware and software. It harbors big innovative enterprises such as BYD, DJI, Tencent, and Huawei, as well as a strong R&D culture. And as China began taking advantage of its maritime potential, its flashpoints, meaning the main zones of conflict, conflict and crisis, shifted. During the 1950s, China's primary flashpoint was Korea, with Taiwan being a secondary hotspot. From the 1960s to the 1980s, the land border with the Soviet Union was China's foremost flashpoint, with the secondary zone of conflict and crisis being its southern border, southern land border with Vietnam, and to some extent the land border with India. In 1995-1996, preceding the fall of the Soviet Union, tensions in the Taiwan Strait became a notable focal point of crisis. However, since approximately 2010, the South China Sea has become China's most serious flashpoint alongside the East China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. This change appears to have coincided with the south and eastward drift of China's centers of economic gravity and its increasing seaborne trade. In 2016, 39% of China's total trade passed through the South China Sea. And China is a top trading partner of over 120 countries. Therefore, the imperative of avoiding naval encirclement and blockade from the United States and its allies, which would disrupt China's ability to pursue trade and economic prosperity constitutes a considerable driver of Chinese strategic culture nowadays. Now, in the Russian case, Russia's strategic culture is strongly influenced by its historical experiences with foreign invasion and the lack of suitable natural frontiers to enhance territorial security. Between 1055 and 1465, Imperial Russia was attacked 245 times. In the 20th century, foreign interventions between 1917 to 1925 and the German invasion in the Second World War were also traumatic experiences that strengthened Russia's historically inherited security concerns. This led to some strategic patterns in Russia's domestic and foreign policy, including the tendency to centralize state power as a result of the need to mobilize society and its resources for war. The continuous aggressive and defensive wars against neighboring countries and some level of paranoia about security and the risk of another war in Russian territory. Russia's geographic centers of gravity lie in the westward portion of its territory, which pushes the country to maintain a buffer zone to stem the risk of attack originating in the European Peninsula. And in the latest three invasions against Russia, 
led by Napoleonic France in the 19th century, Imperial Germany and Nazi Germany, the Baltics, Belarus and Ukraine created a buffer zone that allowed Russia to retreat and exhaust the enemy. The loss of these buffer zones and the territorial contraction in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union aggravated the geographically driven traditional security problems of the vulnerabilities of Russia's external borders, which was accompanied by a loss of great power status in its immediate region and worldwide, leading Russia to eventually adopt coercive instruments to abandon its, its status decline. The Russo-Georgian War, the annexation of Crimea, and the full-scale conventional invasion of Ukraine are examples of this effort. Well, applying Cohen's geopolitical theory to understand the geopolitical foundations of China and Russia's strategic culture, it is possible to identify in this map that China is part of a hybrid East Asian geopolitical realm that is characterized by both continental and maritime footprints. Russia, on the other hand, lies in the continental Eurasian realm, which is inner-oriented and lacks open, accessible pathways to any of the world's oceans. In this population density map, it's possible to identify that most of Russia's population lives in the western fraction of the territory. In blue, Moscow is the largest city in the country with over 10 million inhabitants and near Moscow is St. Petersburg in green, the second largest city in Russia with about 5 million inhabitants. Both of these cities are located very westward of the Russian territory, close to East Europe, where there is what Russian considers the US-led NATO threat. In this population density map about China, it is possible to note that Shanghai, China's largest city in blue, is located on the coast. So are the third and fourth largest cities, respectively Shenzhen and Guangzhou. China still has a large continental geography, especially, especially in its westernmost provinces, but it shares this continentality with a considerable degree of maritime orientation. Now, moving to a positive heuristics exercise to suggest improvements in the existing literature, Krolev's work on Chinese-Russian military cooperation needs to be analyzed because it's one of the finest studies on the topic, but it also has some shortcomings that can be addressed. Krolev proposes verifiable indicators to distinguish the degrees of institutionalization within an alliance. A moderate stage of alliance institutionalization has five key components. An official alliance treaty or agreement, which is not sufficient or even necessary given that an alliance can be informal. Second, mechanisms, mechanisms of intermilitary consultations and military technical cooperation. Third, regular joint military exercises and last, intermilitary confidence building measures. An advanced degree of institutionalization requires an integrated military command, joint troops placement or an exchange of military bases, and a common defense policy. According to Kurolev, China and Russia are in what he calls on the verge of an alliance. Both countries are entering the stage of advanced institutionalization. The evidence for this is the peace mission and joint sea exercises. And Korolev says that the joint sea exercise in 2015 was a geopolitical game changer because it was the largest naval exercise undertaken by the PLA with a foreign navy. The second stage of this exercise was located in, in, the, in the Mediterranean, which can be considered key for NATO. For that purpose, a joint command center was established in the Russian Black Sea port of Novorossiysk, pardon my Russian, and also this exercise happened in a post-Ukraine context. 
In May 2016, China and Russia conducted the airspace security exercise, and it was the first China-Russia computer-simulated missile defense drill. Overall, both countries have been, have been improving joint command codes, interoperability, and joint command coordination. However, there is a problem with Korolev's key argument. Essentially, in all the official documents that Korolev analyzed, there is no clear article or clause binding one party to come to the help of the other in case of external aggression. However, alliances can be informal. They don't necessarily meet an, an official treaty. Just look at US and, and Israel and maybe US and Taiwan, for example. Still, Krolev did not clarify the level of commitment to mutual defense between China and Russia beyond the mere acknowledgement of the common threat represented by the United States. Therefore, saying that China-Russia military cooperation is moving towards a deep institutionalized alliance is a partially sensible conclusion, resting on strong, strong evidence of advanced technical and practical cooperation, as well as mutual recognition of a shared threat. But this cooperation lacks the political and strategic bedrock that enables the operationalization of an effective military alliance, that is, the stipulation of mutual defense aid in case of external aggression. It is not clear whether China would come to the help of Russia in case of a war against NATO or the US, nor is it clear whether Russia would do the same for China in a similar situation. This makes Korolev's key argument more questionable. Can a Chinese-Russian military alliance be really entering at the stage of advanced consolidation if there is no clear or even implicit political commitment to mutual defense? In summary, China and Russia have very discontinuous foreign policy priorities. Russia is primarily interested in curbing NATO expansion in Europe and building up its sphere of influence in East Europe. In contrast, China is seeking to avoid US-led encirclement and blockade in the Indo-Pacific. China does not seem militarily interested in NATO eastward expansion, just like Russia is not really militarily invested in the South China Sea, East China Sea, and Taiwan. <clears throat> now, assessing some geographically driven operational challenges to a full-fledged Chinese-Russian military alliance, which is an analysis that still does not have much prominence in the existing literature, there are some force structure related factors that demonstrate the low compatibility between Russian and Chinese specific security concerns. As this table shows, Russia's commitment of strategic assets, mainly strategic submarines and principal surface combatants to the Northern Fleet is bigger than its commitment to the, to the Pacific Fleet. In the Pacific theater, the Russian Navy operates mainly as a coastal defense force rather than a blue water navy. It is also important to note that in its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia brought in forces from all five military districts, including the Eastern Military District. This might indicate that Indo-Pacific issues do not really constitute a first-rate foreign policy priority for Moscow. Well, when it comes to China, there are two main geographically driven challenges. The first is more land-based. If China and Russia decided to get into a full-fledged military alliance and commit to mutual defense, and if a high-intensity war between Russia and NATO broke out, China would have some challenges with using the existing land-based infrastructure to help Russia with troops and equipment in significant numbers. East of the Urals, uh, Russia has plenty of empty interior places, and even though southwestern Siberia is a long stretch of flatness that flows seamlessly into the steppes of Central Asia and the highlands of western China, using that route to reach here would require massive investments in military infrastructure improvement between China and Russia. 
In the second challenge, if China decided to take things by sea, the stopping power of water would act as a hindrance to sending numerous troops and equipment. The People's Liberation Army Navy is surrounded by U.S. forces and allies. In a real conflict scenario, this would have to be taken into account by the Chinese leadership. Would China be willing to risk a full, a full blown conflict with the US for the sake of commitment to an alliance with Russia? Therefore, the key argument of this research is that geographic discontinuity and disparate strategic cultures seem to shape the degree of proximity and commitment of parties in the Chinese Russian military alliance, despite the, acknowledge, the acknowledgement of a common threat. These are the references that were used in this research. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Janina Gabrian. I'm a researcher at Institute for Applied Artificial Intelligence at Stuttgart Media University in Germany. And today I would like to present to you our study on indirect value creation potentials of AI application and companies. I did the study together with Jürgen Seitz. He's a professor for marketing, media, and digital industries at Stuttgart Media University. First, I would like to give you some information on our research background. We've been doing research on value creation at Stuttgart Media University for a longer time, especially um, Professor Jürgen Seitz. And we've also been doing formal research on AI value creation and the framework of the AI value creation study, and which focuses on direct value creation potentials of the application of AI in companies, which are increase in revenue, reduction of cost, and increase in company value. So to go beyond this, in this study, we focus on indirect value creation potentials. And we would like to answer the question of what goals companies would like to achieve through the application of AI and how those factors can contribute to indirect value creation. For this, our objective in this study was uh, firstly to identify indirect value creation potentials in the application of AI in companies, and secondly, to identify differences in those indirect value creation potentials between uh, sectors and uh, fields of company activities. Our research design consisted of 32 semi-structured interviews with experts from companies which were mainly based in Germany. Uh, we did a qualitative content analysis of the interviews and paraphrased the statements in the interviews on uh, targeted goals that are pursued with the um, AI projects. Um, then we assigned those statements to categories of indirect value creation potentials, um, which we formed inductively in a group discussion among the researchers. And lastly, we did an evaluation of the categories and the sectors of the companies. So now I would like to give you a brief overview of the findings of our study. What you can see here are the categories of indirect value creation potentials that emerged from the interviews that we made. Um, we had a total of 438 statements on goals that are pursued in AI projects. And those 14 categories were built inductively um, based on those statements. As you can see, uh, mostly named were um, statements concerning process optimization and optimization of customer journey, 
but as well, for example, the increase of employee productivity, transformation of business activities, um, up to increase in sustainability, and um, in total we can say that those categories have quite a wide range overall a company function. Our second objective in the study was to identify whether and to what extent there are differences in the indirect value creation potentials between the sectors and fields of activities of the companies that we interviewed. And those two figures show the most outstanding findings that we had in this analysis. You can see clearly that process optimization as a goal that is pursued with AI projects and as so is a indirect value creation potential um, was mainly and most frequently named by experts from companies in the manufacturing industry and wholesale and retail sector and whereas there were almost no mentions from the experts out of the information, communication and media sector. Whereas the sector analysis showed that optimization of the customer journey, which you can see on the right, is particularly relevant for the companies in the information, communication and media sector. And this was mentioned by far the most frequently uh, by the associated companies in this sector. In the other sectors, which were finance and insurance, leisure and tourism, and legal consulting and auditing, there were less clear focal points. Overall, the sample size of the study um, is a limitation, uh, which is why the results do not claim to be representative for all companies and sectors, and certainly some of the deviations between the industries and fields of activity of companies and their indirect value creation potentials um, are due to the fact that we didn't have the same number of companies are represented in all industries. So we think that it would be helpful to use a larger sample and for example an aided study design to investigate the question of why some sectors see little or no potential in some areas. And we would also like to further uh, research in this field um, in order to concretize business value creation through indirect value creation potentials, um, as we think that findings in this area could help companies to pursue goals in the application of AI more concretely and to maximize their success. Concludingly, uh, we can say that we have seen a wide range of indirect value creation potentials in the application of AI in companies that go far beyond the direct value creation potentials, which were increase of revenue, a reduction of cost, and increase of company value. And so uh, companies pursue a wide range of goals with their AI projects that can contribute to value creation. And uh, we've seen that the optimization of the customer journey is particularly relevant for companies in the information, communication and media sector, while process optimization is particularly relevant for companies in the manufacturing industry and wholesale and retail sector, uh, whereas we have seen a less clear focal points in other sectors. So this was my presentation for today. 
uh, thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is Rika Hardani. We are from Gajah Mada University, Indonesia. Let me present our paper entitled Grid Scale Adaptation and Validation. Can the Python CMP program be applied to data sets in psychology? Let me introduce myself. My name is Rika Hardani, Bachelor and Master Degree in Family Development and Community Nutrition from Bogor Agricultural University, IPB, Indonesia, presently enrolled in a psychology doctoral program at Gajah Mada University in Indonesia. Child development, education, positive psychology, psychometry, and mental health are among the research topics of interest. Diana Setiawati, PhD, Bachelor degree in psychology and certification as a professional psychologist at Gajah Mada University in Indonesia. Psychology master degree studies at International Islamic University of Malaysia. Graduated from the University of Melbourne with a doctorate. Currently employed at Gajah Mada University as a lecturer and researchers with expertise in clinical psychology, mental health, and behavior processes. Dr. Yuli Fajar Susetio, Bachelor and Master Degree and a Doctorate in Psychology from Gajah Mada University. Current activity is teaching at the Psychology Faculty of Gajah Mada University. Has a special interest in research in the field of educational psychology, self-regulation learning, academic motivation, and self-leadership. Testing the validity of an instrument is very important in a study. In the field of psychology, there are several methods that are commonly used. Python language CMLP package has only been introduced in the last few years. The purpose of this research is to adapt the grid scale into Indonesian and check the validity using the Python CMLP program. Researchers want to know whether the Python CMOP program can be applied to research in the field of psychology. Background Good research provides a strong foundation for the advancement of knowledge in many domains. So far, it's a must for quantitative research to perform a cure statistical analysis. Several types of software are frequently used in social research such as SPSS, EMOS, LRS, RL. The software's simplicity of use in processing and analyzing statistical data is one of its benefits. But, unfortunately, these spread programs are typically rather pricey. Python language semi packets with Eagle, Kina, and Messer Yikov announced in 2020 have several benefits over already existing programming languages. Since Python language semi packets is open source, open source, anyone conducting research can use it for nothing. Another advantage is that Python language semi packets provides a complete programming environment that is excellent for analyzing scientific data. It can be utilized as a solution for researchers who struggle with comprehending computer language in data analysis because it employs a shorter script code. Python's ease of installation and learning make it further benefit. Grid is highly advantageous for teenage growth, the ability to accomplish goals over a lengthy period, not just a few days, weeks, or months, is known as GRID. Expertly, conducted studies reveal a connection between GRID and academic success, life satisfaction, career success, subjective well-being, belief about well-being, personality strength, disability status, threat and executive functioning, mental well-being, social-emotional learning, and emotional well-being, school burnout prevention, societal behavior, medical business. 
From its development to the present, the grid scale has been used for research in various countries such as, such as India, Mexico, Thailand, Turkey, Philippines, Canada, USA, Japan, United Kingdom, Germany, Pakistan, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Italy, Taiwan, Russia, South Korea, and Australia. This research is expected to contribute to science, especially in the field of psychology. First complement the lack of research on the Eastern cultural fashion of the grid scale. And second, by using the Python CMOP program for statistical testing of data, we are enhancing the analytical methods that can be used in social research. The study aims to carry out the process of adapting the grid scale to Indonesia. In addition, reliability and validity are tested in high school students from four schools in Banten, Indonesia. The research team has received permission from the school to involve students in the study. The students' parents fill out the concern form and the child also filled out the concern form. The use of Google Form as a way to collect data, online research is considered practical to do. Then, perform a statistical analysis, analysis using Python language CMOP package to test the reliability and validity of Indonesia version of the grid scale. The research team carried out the grid scale adaptation process by following the guidelines of WHO 2022. Six stages have been carried out. The study involved 582 high school students. From the results of statistical analysis, the two aspects showed almost the same Cronbach alpha value. Cronbach alpha is 0.69 on the patient side and 0.70 on the perseverance side. On the other hand, the total Cronbach alpha coefficient obtained is 0.70. According to Pinto et al., Cronbach alpha value above uh, 0.6 is considered acceptable. The result of the following statistical test is the confidence internal value of 95% CL. Uh, 0 0.665 until 0 0.738. For confirmatory factor analysis, CFA validity test, the CFA patient aspect has validity of 0 0.53 to 0 0.70, and the CFA perseverance aspect has a range of 0 0.41 to 0. 90. The comparative confirmity index CFI value is 0 0.94. The results of the Indonesian grid-scale reliability analysis test shows the same values as the original grid-scale developed by Duckworth and colleges. This means that the Indonesian adapted grid scale can be used as a basis for practical and applicable grid variables in Eastern cultures, including Indonesia. The effectiveness of the Indonesian adaptive grid scale shows a value that is almost the same as the original grid scale. In addition, the result of the reliability and validity test using Python language CMOP packets show that the Indonesian version of grid scale has an acceptable conformity value. The study concludes that the use of grid variable in Eastern cultures such as Indonesia is appropriate. Similarly, the use of the Python CMOP programming languages can be used to analyze social science. Python CMOP, which is open source, is one solution to increase the number of resources in lower middle income countries such as Indonesia because the resources do not require additional costs to perform data analysis.
The limitation of this study is that it only involves adolescents its participant. Additionally, the kinds of statistical tests that are run can be increased. This is appendix. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. As you can see on the screen, our topic is a correlational study between the numbers of children and types of mice. First of all, let's start by saying a few words about my own background. My name is Ms. Nabasanta Glari. I am 18 years old. I come from Thailand and I am a student of a retired online school. First of all, I will begin with an abstract. Nowadays, some people prefer to have a knowledge shy because of the cause of raising children, or some people have two to train children in their family. From the hypothesis, the numbers of children influences the actions of children who behave in various situations, which is different and cause differences myself in children. Depending on the numbers of children, a person myself is a collection of ideas that influence how they perceive themselves and can divide into categories. First is a fixed mindset, and second is a grown mindset. This study aims to identify the correlation between the numbers of children and doing mindset theory. We use a 12 item questionnaire with 12 questions and questions created using a five Likert scale as a method to test the hypothesis. A total of 100 voluntary respond were received. The analysis supported the theoretical framework that there was a moderate positive correlation between the child with siblings and the grown myself. In conclusion, a child with siblings is more likely to construct a grown myself from losing a self confidence. Okay. Right. Let's move on to the next one. The difference between a single child and multiple child. As you know, each family has different factors to have shine, like money and time. An only shy is a person with no siblings by birth or adoption. Mostly, they tend to receive more attention, time, and money. The only shy is a self-conduct, self-centered, and achievement oriented. Okay, sorry. By the way, other family don't want their children to be alone, so they got them a sibling. Sibling relationships are the starting point for children's socialization. Siblings are usually children's first teammates, enemies, and role models. They learn every skill from their siblings, and that's it. As I said before, we want to identify the correlation between the numbers of children and the wake myself theory. So let's go to the next one. Drawing myself theories, a mental attitude that determines how to think, perceive their ability, and solve problems under various circumstances is this guy to be a myself. We classify myself into types, such as the people who believe their intelligence could be developed and confidence is a grand mindset 
ordinary. On the other hand, a person with a fixed mindset does not like challenges because they are afraid of looking bad or scared of lose. As a result, they perceive that their skills and ability could not be improved. Hence, a fixed mindset person think more negatively than a person with a good mindset. <laughs> Our purpose is to identify the correlation between the numbers of children and the weak mindset theory. We use Google Form and Google Sheets as method in this study. In the online questionnaire, Google Form, we used 100 respondents, then we various random age, gender, and numbers of siblings, which the answer will which the answer will link to the question. Example like you are a single shy, if you should single shy, it will link to the single shy question. And the same way as the multiple shy. Our research was complete with the 12 questionnaire statement. All of these were chosen in five point like your type scale. Langjing from strongly agree, scale five, to strongly disagree, scale one. And the next one is data analysis. After we got all the response, then we need to calculate by the absolute points of each voluntary first, then get all the numbers in each row to calculate the correlation coefficients by the correlational method. And this is our result. Correlational relationship more than 0 0.5 is a moderately correlation, but if less than 0 0.5 is a weak correlation. So, the grown mices correlation in single shy we got four pi thirty, and multiple shy we got four pi twenty three. As a result, they would likely have better learning performance. This means that children can improve their skills, and they have more self confidence. They would not be afraid due to failure. They acquire new knowledge, flexibly, and their ability. Fix my sense. Correlation in single child, we got 2.58, and multiple child, we got 2.22. In this case, a fixed mindset that prioritized intelligent based compensation above effort based price would have adverse effects. For instance, student learning ability may show less growth due to avoiding barrier, thus costing mission and the ability, skills and talents are natural and cannot be developed. To sum up, there was a positive correlation between multiple shies and growth mices, as well as a negative correlation between the multiple shies and fixed mices. The rationale be behind this is having a social support and education would like to encourage children to improve their skills and self-confidence. Moreover, we should recommend that parents and teachers are more likely to develop a grown mindset in child with siblings. More precisely, 
If parents educate their children to have a growth mindset, this might develop self-confidence and support them to grow their mindset in the long term. Lastly, a child with self-confidence may be motivated to learn a new thing, not be afraid to make a mistake and always aspire to do better. The youngsters are therefore more likely to achieve their goal in terms of performance. And this is our reference. That's been our presentation to the end. Thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure for being here. Thank you.